when and then in the uh, 80s uh, when I uh, got my second divorce which was really tragic uh, I hit the road I always wanted to do stand-up and it was the heyday of stand-up and I hit, a, hit that road because uh, the music changed into a very negative mode at the end of the 80s yeah. you know and I, I just wasn't into that but wait let's back up a little sure. bit how did you get started well, sort of the beginning of the beginning. The very beginning was my father was a big band singer in the 30s and 40s. So you always had music in the house. And my grandfather on my mother's side, even though he wound up washing windshields, he was he was a marvelous musician. I never met him. He he disappeared when I was six months old. Oh boy. So I had it in the genes, uh, and I got I was very very intrigued by it when. Uh, I was about 17, and it started to come back. I played piano when I was seven, eight years old, and from what I understand, I was very good. But my <laughs> father lost his business, and we were evicted a bunch of times. And uh, So it was an unstable child. It was, uh, unstable is an understatement. <laughs> uh, all the kids slept in one bed. Oh, boy. <laughs> when it got cold, my mother threw another brother in. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> so anyway, and there's nowhere else to go. <laughs> we start describing that. This place will be a barn in the morning. <laughs> so uh, from there, I had to leave school very early. My father went bust, and uh, uh, I had a young sister in uh, 1960. My kid sister was born in July. I turned 16 in November. And I had to figure a way to bring some money in to put food on the table for uh, two brothers, two sisters, a mother and father. And I got a job, finally got a job at Howard Johnson's on the boardwalk in Asbury Park. And I was happy to have it. And it was a busboy and dishwasher. It didn't matter. I got a job. Was it in the summer? It was in the summer of 62. It was Well, I got hired in February. But the summer of 62 was a turning point. And what happened in the summer of 62? Well, it right, like a movie. <laughs> right next door was Convention Hall where all the big events happened. Mm -hmm. uh, the rock and roll shows, the wrestling matches, the boxing tickets, whatever. And um, most of the people who played there would come in because it was a short walk to Howard Johnson's mm -hmm. and have a lunch between shows or whatever. And one day the Dovells came in. There was a big Cameo Parkway Records, Chubby Checker, yeah. The Orlans, Dovells, D.D. Yeah, Sharp. One label at Convention Hall. And interestingly, I was very inspired by Philadelphia music, even though I was born in Newark, New Jersey, grew up in the Asbury area. Right. But my earliest records that inspired me in the late 50s going into the 60s were Frankie Avalon. Mm -hmm. and Who you Chan ended up working with. Oh, absolutely. Yeah and reviving his career mm -hmm. and all of the for some reason all the Bobby Rydell's the Dovell's the Orlans and Chubby and Dave Apple my dear friend who yes. did the show mm -hmm. here with me a few Dave months was ago with us in July July we did a show here when enjoyed it mm -hmm. and I was I bought found, I wound up buying all those records so all of a sudden the Dovells come in and I was completely mesmerized what were you doing at the time? Were you busing a table? I was busing the table. They were in my station, and oh they walked gosh. in with the same suits. And and had I they, went, had they just finished playing? They were either finished or on the because they did matinees back then. Yeah. And I asked for autographs. I collected their place mats, and they're good <laughs> friends of mine now. And right. I even opened for them as a comedian. Uh, of course, that's my version. <laughs> so anyway. <laughs> I was blown out, and I got bit by the bug. Mm -hmm. Prior to that, just before I got that uh, gig, of course, after I met the Dovells, I went out and I bought a shirt to match their shirts. Oh, you did? Oh, Were you yeah. hoping to be another Dovell? <laughs> I was a Dovell. I took a picture like Jerry Gross. Oh I bought God. a $40 K guitar, <laughs> and every hour I wasn't working, I was practicing. But the, but the bug came a little bit before that because... I was, I don't want to say neglected, but we didn't have a lot as kids. And I, I made my peace with my parents, but my teeth were very bad. 
and my Aunt Laura took me to Newark, New Jersey after I left school, said, Bill, you're never going to get anywhere. you got to come up, and we're going to, Grandma and I are going to help you, and, and I deeply Aww, appreciate that. That's very sweet. And after a few months of having a lot of dental work done, the day we finished the dental work was the uh, October 13, 1961 the day before my 17th birthday. And I looked in the mirror for the first time in years and was happy. Aww. And I sat at the kitchen table at my grandmother's house, and she always had the radio on. And I remember the lion sleeps tonight by the tokens oh, sure. came on. Mm -hmm. And I started instinctively singing along with the record. And I convinced myself I had a good voice. Until today, I'm the only one with that. No, I'm kidding. I'm, I'm kidding. You do um, have a marvelous voice. Thank you very you much. Do. So that was really the beginning, but the but meeting the Dovells, and then I just excelled. So I got a job after Howard Johnson's at the Empress Motel, which was the creme de la creme in Asbury Park, okay. was the Rat Pack days. Yeah. Everybody that played convention hall in every club on every corner in the Strip Stayed out there. of town, stayed there. Mm -hmm. I was a room service waiter and a busboy, and I, I worked 14 hours a day. My only day off was the first Monday of every month. I brought every nickel home. We were five kids, mother and father, one bedroom apartment, wow. and I was the breadwinner. That's tough. And That's uh, um, by Saturday night, I was burnt out, and the band used to love to get me up in the lounge to sing Pennies from Heaven and tell jokes. <laughs> and one night, Clay Cole, the Dick Clark of New York, who had a television show, mm -hmm. was in town hosting a show. Everybody was staying at the hotel. Gene Pitney, Clyde Down McFadden, without pity, right? <laughs> Paul and Paula, mm -hmm. a guy named Brad Connolly, and uh, Clay. I got up, I did my shtick, and the waitress said, Billy, that table would like to talk to you. Uh-oh. <laughs> and I went over, and they invited me to New York. Said Clay said, I'm living at the Bryant Hotel on 54th and Broadway. And when you have a day off, call me, come up. I want to introduce you to a manager friend. And I went up and got signed. That was uh, July 16th of 1963. And I've been in the business ever since, except for the two years I was in the Army in Vietnam. Let's, let's hear one of Billy's, or maybe a couple of Billy's songs. Do you have... Something cute off Keith, maybe yeah, Rio? We're going to uh, we're how about, how about bring it down for a second and then we'll. Uh interesting story because I had uh, had I broke into the I didn't know it was disco I mean in in, in 75 um, I was making records and uh, I got a deal uh, to record Benny Troy mm -hmm. an artist that I had quite a bit of success with and I recruited a just a marvelous group of as I all as I've always done marvelous group of classic musicians in New York. I worked all the big studios. And um, I wrote a song called I Want to Give You Tomorrow. And the drummer, Alan Schwartzberg, as I counted the song off, he started to play that hi-hat rhythm, mm -hmm. which became the signature of disco. And uh, the record is still a cult record today, very big in England. Um, Still, I mean, unlike the Jerry Lewis of England, <laughs> 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 my songs. And uh, so 
uh, I had a good run in Frankie Avalon's Venus. Oh, and what? I, and I got a call. If you want to play that, that was a breakthrough record. Well, yes. Let's cue that one up. Yeah. And then I'll continue. Yeah, these two stories are interesting. These are great stories. These stories are interesting. Yeah. Venus? Better than my life, but... <laughs> Everybody we to be dancing back here. Everyone resisted it. Everybody said I was crazy. Oh. Oh. Download the vocal version. Oh well, I got what I could. <laughs> well, you lucky you. <laughs> <laughs> so, tell the stories first about Rio. Well, Venus came first. Oh, Venus came first? Okay. Frankie Avalon, uh, a record label called me one day, Delight Records. Actually, I recorded Benny Troy for that label and did a lot of work with Cool and the Gang and a lot of mm -hmm. the other acts as a consultant. And uh, the label called me one day and uh, said, uh, Billy, uh, some friends of ours would like us to help Frankie Avalon. And uh, we, we want to know, what do you think? And I said, sign him. And they said, you're kidding. Because they didn't was expect me to say it. Was this during his movie Star Hey Day? No, no? This, was, this was in 1975. Okay. And I didn't find out until the, later until the book came out, uh, the uh, Billboard book of number one yes. adult contemporary records, because mm -hmm. our record was number one. Um, I didn't know that prior to Frankie meeting me, Paul Anka, earlier that year, had written ten songs specially for Frankie, did demos, and Paul Anka walked around to 14 record companies and everyone no had turned deal. him. No deal. Wow. Frankie That's Avalon, amazing. and I found out also reading the book, which I didn't know initially, is that Frankie uh, in uh, October of 75 was about to sign a deal with a hotel in Hawaii to work the lounge five nights a week. How sad is that? No, not well, too bad. I mean, well, look, I mean, it tapered off. Think. It tapered off. Yeah. So he comes to New York. The label didn't believe that I wanted to sign him, and I said, please do it, because he was an idol of mine. And what label was it? Delight Records. Delight. Big label. <laughs> Uh, they were very good. They had a lot of good records, cool in the gang and everything. Mm -hmm. So anyway, in the first meeting, as Frankie tells it, um, I wrote a song called Somewhere Over Arizona. That really was a really beautiful song. Everybody was flipped over the song. And uh, Frankie brought some little dippy song in, like a Bobby Vinton, la, 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 la. Mm -hmm. And I said, so, puff. <laughs> puff. <laughs> so I said, fine. I said, can I say something, folks? I have an arrangement in my head of Venus. And Frankie said, wait a minute. I don't want to touch that song. Oh, right. And the record company said, well, we can't get the publishing. And I says, yeah, but to be quite honest, and all due respect to Frankie, I think the only chance we have is to capture this new beat, what they're calling disco, mm -hmm. what I stumbled on, and, and got our, and me and a couple of other guys got everybody started with that beat. Me, Tony Bon Jovi, Bon Jovi's, who's a former partner of mine, when he did Gloria Gaynor's Never Can Say uh -huh, Goodbye. Great song. It was Gloria Gaynor, me, and a couple of other guys. Mm -hmm. And I said, do this. I'll have the musicians play the track, the last mm -hmm. one on the session, in my arrangement. Right. If you don't like it, don't pay for it. The guys will cooperate with me. So I did this record, this arrangement. Frankie put his voice on it. And they put the record out eight days later. It was on the charts. And he went from working in a mafia club in Brooklyn. <laughs> it's a bad word. <laughs> I'll pay for it. Questionable. <laughs> Get a look at the a thumbs. It's the last time, you, last time you'll see my thumbs. Right. <laughs> so, so the uh, 
the record went like a house on fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of weeks later, all in one week, he did Donnie Shore, Merv Griffin, Mike Douglas, Midnight Special, mm -hmm. American Bandstand, and Sonny and Cher. And we were off to the races. Wow. That's pretty amazing. Yeah. Now, with Rio, because I had a run with Avalon, and then I had a run of other records, uh, a guy named Jose Sabrino at Top Tape in Brazil, through an attorney that I knew, wanted me to do a session for him. He wanted me to take uh, the, the Angel song, Till the Moon Deserts the Sky, mm -hmm. and do an instrumental, a disco instrumental version. So Jose comes to town, we met, and I said, well, you know, I've got a good arrangement in my head, but would you entertain me doing the same thing with Till that I did with Avalon? because the angels are friends of mine. They did my boyfriend's friends back. Right. I says, I'd like to put the angels, like I did Avalon, on there. And he said, ooh, that's nice, I'll do it. So I got signed the girls. And he says, well, just do anything for the B-side, Billy. I says, no, no. We can make the B-side an instrumental version of mm -hmm. two. Suppose I write a cool song and bring a friend of mine in that already had some hit records. Gary Chris was a um, lead singer of the Glass Bottle in 72. He had a top 10 record with Ain't Got Time Anymore. Mm -hmm. So he says, oh, if you want to do it, do it. I don't care. So I wrote and produced Rio de Janeiro with Gary. And he put a 12 inch out when he got home to Brazil. And the 12 inch found its way to New York City and the record entered the chart at number 11. Oh, yeah. And all it's considered today one of the classic disco records. All time records. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And all Played the, every all single the DJ day. Pools picked it up. But even oh, today, yeah. Sirius Radio, every single day, all over cable, all over Sirius. Yeah, it's a marvelous song. It's, it is a great song. Yeah. I'm looking forward to a second birth next year with the Olympics in Brazil. Mm -hmm. Because when um, the record was hot, uh, one year, I think 1978, it was the theme song at the Brazilian 500 really? uh, car race. Yes. Wow. And I got, ripped off by, I got ripped off by Sergio Valente. Oh, Sergio? <laughs> After the record was a big hit, Rio de Janeiro. Right. Well, I know the song you're talking about now. <laughs> they, what they did in all the Sergio Valente close ads, mm -hmm. They did Sergio Valente. They mm -hmm. just took that little piece and I could do nothing about it. Oh, that's a shame. That's all right. It happens. It's very flattering, though. Yeah. <laughs> My ex-wife didn't think so. <laughs> she had the money spent. Oh. Was that ex-wife number one or two? Oh, that was two. Don't that start me two. on number one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So let's cue up some more music, uh, Keith, if we can. Yeah. What there, else do we have in there? How well, about the Backstabbers? Well, that's Larry Carlton. That's yeah, one of the Larry latest Carl. records I've done that's been very successful. Um, I recorded Larry Carlton, Gamblin' Huff, in Phil the Sound of Philadelphia. Yeah. A very big influence on me. I love this song. I, love I, did, this with, I yeah, did this great. with Larry Carlton, the classic guitarist. That's a great, great song. Yeah. And Larry, uh, here's another interesting story, though. Uh, I, I recorded uh, David Clayton Thomas from Blood, Sweat, and Tears many times great through voice. the years. Oh, Wonderful gosh. voice. Yeah. And uh, in the uh, when Michael McDonald uh, came out with his Motown mm -hmm. record tribute, which, in my opinion, was a very weak re recording. I like Michael very much, but it was uh, weak. 
Okay. Uh, but I'm it a worked. Producer. But yeah, it I'm worked. A but it worked. Uh, I listened to that and it went so well. And I went to New York because my publishing company was with Warner Chapel, uh, who published all Gamble and Hoff and yeah. my stuff and everything. Mm -hmm. And I went to Neil Gillis and I said, Neil, you know something? I think a Gamble Enough tribute, like that Motown tribute with another blue-eyed soul artist. Mm -hmm. And the guy I have is David Clayton. Very recognizable voice. So I was able to raise the money to do this Record Plus video. And unfortunately, David was having some health issues and just wasn't coming off good. So I had to shelf it. Mm -hmm. So I went out to L.A. and I talked to uh, uh, Azoff Management that mm -hmm. had Michael McDonald, and they had uh, Michael Bolton. We're talking about Irving Azoff. Irving Azoff. Uh, I went out to the L.A., and um, Michael McDonald's had an, another album coming out. Uh, Bolton had an original album coming out that went nowhere, but he didn't want to do it. Boss Skaggs wanted to work with me, but the keys on the songs didn't work. For him. So I ran out of... Uh, Talent. I ran out of white artists from the 70s, soulful artists. I couldn't do uh, this record with a black artist. It wouldn't mean anything. No, absolutely Because not. they were all gambling off Teddy Pendergrass, the spinners, the stylistics, uh, uh, all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, whatever. So the only way I could go was I said, well, maybe I'll do it instrumentally. And a former manager of mine was managing Larry, and I took it to them, and we did it, and it was two years on the charts. Two years? Two years. Wow. Uh, the album made it to number four, and I had three um, individual songs that went into the top five. And one week on Music Choice, Comcast, mm -hmm. I had the number one album and number one single. Wow. Yeah. Was that on the adult contemporary charts or jazz charts? It was on uh, the groove jazz charts, the uh, smooth jazz charts. Mm -hmm. It was on all those jazz charts. Yeah, so it was very cool. How about a little more music? Do we have anything else over there to play? Let's see. Well, Never Gonna Let Him Know is on there, which was my first hit record as a writer. Oh. oh. But Never Let Him Know. Yeah. Okay, let's have a listen to that. Is it? Is it? No. No, it's this. Oh, God, God, God. Well, if you want to let that run, this is the song I wrote recently. With your name forever on the wall. This is a tribute to the wall now in Washington. We are it's just a demo place to go. We can pray and pay respects with them, the loved ones and the friends we've all come to know. Questions left unanswered since my youth. I wonder if we'll ever know the truth. Torn between holding on and letting go. It's got to be the hardest thing to do. Mom and I have cried our tears. We've been searching all these years for you. If we only knew. Yeah. I wrote this as a tribute to the... Uh